Okay. Uh, I think we should probably start. What do okay. you say? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think we can start. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, Naya, your show. Yeah. So welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon session uh, of Meet the Stars. And we are looking forward to engaging with um, some of the leading thought on leaders uh, of, in education and to discuss the future of higher education in the backdrop of this you know, crisis, world crisis. So my name is Laia Canals. I'm from the Open University in Catalonia and I will be your host today. And um, at the beginning, I think we should have a round of introductions and uh, I will introduce the speakers uh, from top to right. Uh, so Ishai Moore um, from Meital, Israel. Uh, next is uh, Lisa Marie Blaschke uh, from the Center for Lifelong Learning at the University of Oldenburg, Germany. Uh, Alison Littlejohn, um, Director of the London's Knowledge Lab at UCL uh, in the UK. Um, Jim Groom uh, from Reclaim Hosting in Italy. And uh, Philip Schmidt uh, from the MIT uh, Media Lab in the US. So without um, further ado, we'll jump right away to the questions. We'll just first ask uh, the, the speaker some questions and then we'll open up for everyone to ask other questions. So um, Alison, <laughs> how do you foresee the current pandemic impacting higher education in the short and in the long run? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's a question on the, the lips of every provost um, or vice chancellor of universities. In the short term, we've seen this pivot online and a big question amongst educational technologists is whether or not that pivot online is going to stay. So in the future, how much of the teaching and learning is going to be online? How much will be blended and hybrid? Um, and, you know, I think one thing that almost gets forgotten in all of this Hello? is what does it mean for the for the students and for the for the teachers as well so we've actually been doing a study of how people have, have managed this transition pivot online um, at UCL and we've been running a survey and interviewing colleagues about their experiences of uh, working online and what we found is that um, some of the disadvantages which already exist in society are being deepened. Um, so we're finding that um, how people feel about teaching online, there's, there's a big spectrum from people who say, this is the best thing that's ever happened. I can work fantastically well online to people who say this is a worse thing because I feel really isolated and anxious and I don't know how to teach online. But most people are somewhere in the middle where they feel some things are good, uh, they don't have the commute to work, for example, and some things are, are not so good for them. But we're finding that there are groups who are particularly disadvantaged and those are women uh, and particularly those with caring responsibilities, anyone with caring responsibilities. And by that, I mean child care while children being at home and not at school, elder care, care for others, but also caring for students and all the extra time that people have had to spend online helping students get through the pandemic uh, and, and other caring responsibilities for colleagues who are trying to get online. So that means that a lot of people have been focusing their work around the teaching and caring and not so much around other areas that in universities will generally help to get promotion, like research, for example. And we've also seen a big drop in the number of women who are um, submitting papers to journals. So that's, that's all been difficult. This might be different from what you expected me to say, but this is the reality of, of what's happening. We've also found that um, accessibility has been an issue for colleagues, particularly those with um, specific disabilities because universities have tended towards a very narrow range of um, tools that don't necessarily help 
those disabilities while we would expect that technology tools would help people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, black ethnic minority people are particularly disadvantaged for all kinds of reasons and we have to address that. So moving forward, universities really need to think how they work, what their policies are, how people are employed, what it means for students, and so on. So that's okay. my start of Thank the you. Thank you, Alison. Yeah. Uh, yes, now it would be Yishai's turn. Um, so Yishai, what do you think is the best, uh, next, big, uh, next big thing to disrupt higher education? And what do you, why do you think so? And what do we need to get there? Okay, thanks. So um, I would say this, you know, if, if you can see the picture in my background, um uh the classroom so i know you might expect me to say you know big data or ai or or uh virtual uh, worlds or something like that but actually i think the the really the next big thing is that people will go back to classrooms you know it might be in a month in two months next term but at some point we'll be past corona and people go back to classroom and when they find themselves in this situation where they're you know effectively in, in the distance learning you know if 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 the, you have a lecture on the podium and people are just sitting there passively it's effectively a distance learning situation and after being through you know learning by zoom and all that you say hang on you know if this is distance learning i'd rather be at home because I know that works. So if I if I made the effort to come to the classroom, you have the responsibility to make it worth my time. So you need to make the classroom um, something that's worth coming to. And and I, I really expect that to come uh, both from 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 students and and from teachers uh now i think in a way we're, we're already seeing even now that that um you know when we're talking about virtual learning spaces and uh this morning we had a session about about uh different uh methods of teaching online and a lot of people are talking about how can i make it uh, more active, you know, and using uh, multiple rooms and uh, teamwork and and um, and and I see a lot of people here, you know, unknown and and Lisa and people coming from the Utagaki kind of paradigm and you know so passing the ownership over to learners again all the good things that we will see um in in online learning will definitely then be amplified when we go back to the classroom um i mean that, that said i think the issues that allison raises about equity and and you know and 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 gender and um kind of underserviced or, or uh marginalized communities obviously that's an impact that's going to stay with us for a while because when we go back to the classroom suddenly um, the the differences between those who could just continue their studies as you know, or their work as if nothing happened and those that were left behind suddenly all those differences would be apparent and we would need to uh, to kind of um, address them so that that's kind of briefly my my, my take on this uh, so now I get to ask a question yes, right yes okay so uh, so Lisa um what do you say about the you know this online pivot of 2020 um how, how do you see this kind of projecting into the future how do you see will this take us backwards because people will sort of be disillusioned by online learning or will this take it forward because suddenly people realize that it's not the medium it's you know there is a message that's deeper than the medium what do you think You're muted. Yeah, I know. I, this is one of my Zoom problems I have every single time I use Zoom. Um, I think the short answer to your question is yes, uh, because uh, I think there are really uh, a couple of groups of people that we're looking at right now. There's a group that says, um, I really just want to go back to the way things were before. 
um, there's the group that says, well, I'm just going to try to muddle through, tread water until, um, until we know what's going to happen. Uh, and then there's a group that says, okay, we're, we've got this, let's try to use this as an opportunity. And so what I've been doing in the last few months is really concentrating on that third group and trying to move the other groups into that third group to look at the opportunities that online offers. Because if you stay, you know, if you stay in that place where you, where you say, okay, face-to-face -face is really the only and the best way, then you really miss out on the opportunities that online offers you. Uh, for example, more engagement with your, with your learners, uh, an opportunity for them to take more responsibility for, for their learning. And here again, I bring up the, the hoidagogy of the self-determined learning aspect. Uh, giving them agency to make decisions about their learning. Um, and this is something that's been coming out of the pandemic as well. People have been saying, or students have been saying, I really like being able to make decisions about things, taking more responsibility for the work that I'm doing. And so I think what, what we, it could go either way. It's, it's, really, um, it, it re it's really going to be dependent um, both on the teachers and on the students because teachers are going to have to let go of that need to control the classroom. I mean, we have instances here in Germany where teachers um, say, okay, you have to be in class at two o'clock. You come in, I'm going to lecture to you for an hour or two hours, and then uh, you ask a couple of questions and then you can go home and then you fulfilled your, your requirement of, of coming to class. Whereas there's other teachers that say, you know what, I'm going to redo this. I'm going to do a video of my lecture. I'm going to post it. I'm going to have my students look at it beforehand. And then when we all get together into a synchronous environment, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give them questions or I'm going to identify areas that they can improve, you know, where they can improve upon or where they can ask, you know, ask more questions. Um, so it really depends on the teachers, the amount of agency that they give the students and also on the students, how much agency are they willing to accept? Because there are the students that say, I don't want to do online learning. I don't want to take responsibility for my learning. I want my instructor to give me a lecture and tell me what it is that I need to learn instead of giving them that opportunity. So I think it could go both ways, but I'm of course an advocate for let's go out there, let's take every opportunity that we can um, to uh, embrace online learning, to really get the benefits of both, because that's going to that, that is going to prepare us for the future because we've got a future where we're not sure what's going to happen next. So my advice to my instructors is always go out, find a solution that can work in both worlds, in the online world and in the face-to-face -face world, and then adapt it as we move forward. So that would be my long answer to your question. <laughs> I guess I'm asking the next question, and this is open to anyone who would like to answer it. Is that right, Leia? Um, is the push for digital literacy, digital fluency, an approach that really solves our online problem? Tools, information bubbles, disinformation, or does it simply give a whole new generation of digitally literate bigots a new set of tools to work with? Oh, wow. That's, hold on. Let me make sure people know who's talking. Wait, there it is. Okay. Um, that's a loaded question and it actually comes from an essay uh, that was basically, I think, interrogating some of the questions. And it's a question that deals with a lot of stuff. For example, all of us somewhat became quickly digitally literate around Zoom. How not to interrupt. All these people were giving us information. How do I do that virtual background? How do I stream it out? Like we all had to figure out this technology pretty quick to get our job done, right? And there's a certain amount of digital efficiency, effectiveness to that. A broader idea, though, that has kind of been floated in higher ed more generally is what does it mean to make our teachers, our faculty, our students digitally literate, to build and create in an ecosystem where they can actually understand how the web works. And one of the, the essay that that quote comes from had a real interesting provocation. And the provocation was, what if this literacy and this training and this fluency, rather than getting us out of the fake news and misinformation bubble that we all seem to, to kind of exist within, whether it's on Facebook, what if it's actually just training for the next generation of uh, online trolls? And that's a really problematic question that I don't know if I have a full answer to, because I have been of the camp that 
by understanding the web, by understanding this technology, by understanding how these tools work, uh, we're creating a next generation um, environment for teaching and learning. Some of which, like Yiche is suggesting, no, we need to get back to the classroom. So that's not even a kind of stable point. Um, but I do think that our kind of unquestioned assumptions about this notion of digital fluency and digital literacy and media literacy as unproblematic, particularly given the fact of the media landscape and environment we live in, is a really provocative and one I am actually almost like struggling with uh, in, a, in a relationship of like, what's my role in that? And, you know, what does that look like? So I don't know if that's an answer as much as a kind of a reframing of the question, because I don't know. I want to believe that, no, maybe it's all good, but I'm not convinced. I, I think there is something that goes beyond digital literacy, and that's what I would call epistemic literacy. And it's, it's about, you know, understanding how, how, to, how to judge if something is, is, is worth, uh, worth conversation, if, if something holds any value. And, and the problem, you know, people can, I mean, it's very easy to sort of teach digital literacy in the, in the technical terms, right? But as you say, you know, if, if you have a very, you know, I mean, if you get a driving license at 16 and then you can get a very fast car, that doesn't mean that you're really someone that, you know, is safe to be with on the road, right? I mean, there, there is a sort of deeper understanding of your responsibility as a driver, which, you know, I don't know how you teach it. I mean, some of us pick it up, some of us don't. Um, there's, a, there's an adjunct to that that is interesting, and I never turned off my color bar, so I'm sorry. But there's an adjunct to that that's interesting in that as we go digital and we have gone digital globally for conferencing, for video stuff, a question about that notion of, is that how we exist, right? Is there a kind of philosophical relationship to our being and our presence online through these media and what that means in terms of not only our presentation, but how we communicate you know, how we really do some basic things, which we understood as the, you know, as the simple glue that pulled together a learning institution or a learning relationship. And so I think it's not even just like, oh, I'm efficient with the tools. It's, oh, to be and to exist and to practice within this space now, um, there are certain expectations, syntactical, grammatical, that are virtualized and technical. And I think in that regard, it, it really starts to not just be like, oh, technically and philosophically, the two shall never meet. It starts to become this world gets more matrixy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like we are moving into this space where the philosophical elements of the technology that we've assumed and never privileged, always privileging face to face, have started to come at a bear. And that's part of the cultural struggle we're feeling right now about get back to classroom or should we reframe this? Like, I think it's not only a culture, cultural issue and that will change depending on your context, but also a philosophical and almost a, like an obelisk moment from Stanley Kubrick's 2001, right? Like, boom, everything evolves and changes dramatically in a moment. And what does that mean? So I'll shut up now because I've talked a lot, but I don't know why I have, but I have. <laughs> Okay, the next question is for Leah, and that is, do you think what some have called emergency remote teaching is here to stay, or will we see the surge of more reflective approaches to online learning being born out of this situation? That's a really good question. I'm looking right. forward to hearing. Yeah, so, um, well, first, I think we all agree that uh, this, uh, this change, right, this transition to online, um, was you know inevitable it just got accelerated right and in that acceleration um a lot of things fall up you know fell apart um i think it, it was very much rushed and that's why they term this uh, the term emergency remote teaching makes a lot of sense because it was not well thought um and and the outcomes of all that some will be some 
can be good, but most of them will be like trial and error, right? Um, and what I've seen is, um, what I've seen is in, in my kids, for instance, in my kids' case, uh, in my kids' school, they got it right, but they got it right because they had the common sense to make something up very quickly. And even more quickly than in my kids' school, um, it was it was arranged in my uh, in my kids uh, extracurricular activities. So from one day to the next, they were doing um, um, basketball practice in the court, and the next day they were doing it online on Zoom. Um, and it, for the teachers, it took a bit longer than than for the extracurricular activities. And I was surprised that um, that some got it somewhat right so fast. But um, so I think since we have a lot of people trying. So some of it will come out nice and good, but um, but also this rushing into the online uh, realm or uh, distance learning, um, um, I see some bad practices or some problems uh, that I see in many places, right? And one of it is like the um, translating everything that you do face to face exactly online, which is like the rookie's mistake, right? Um, and the second uh, is this obsession uh, with uh, an over-reliance on synchronicity and everything needs to happen at the times that, you know, you have to sit the kids in front of the computer between 9 and 12 and then have a lunch break and then sit them back in front of the computer in the afternoon. Um, and I think this evidences a lot of uh, a lack in, in, in teacher preparation and, and and obviously lack of guidance also from from teaching um, from leaders in the schools and also from governments. Um, um, so lack of guidance on how to implement and, and use technology for online, good online learning, right? So that would be my answer. And now I need to ask a question uh, to somebody who hasn't talked yet, uh, Philip. Yeah. So. What tools outside the, the traditional virtual learning environment or, or learning management systems um, are being used? I know you, you founded a, a P2P university, right? And which is uh, mostly um, based on communities, right? And uh, learning from each other. So what can you tell us about, um, about that? Is, that? is it a good time to revisit, you know, this um, maybe uh, clusters where people learn from each other and with each other. Um, I think it is, but I kind of want to um, also uh, chime in on an earlier question. And um, it's what Yishai said about um, that the expectations are going to shift. And I'm, I hope he's right, but I worry that he may not be because my sense is that um, people are much more accepting of the in-person lecture because afterwards they can go to the break and hang out with their friends. They're in a space together that feels social and it's, um, it's reserved for learning and you're not, not as distracted because you've kind of made the commitment to go to campus. And even though those are all bad, like I completely agree, it's bad pedagogy. I just think that people are much more willing to accept and and live with the bad pedagogy if they get to hang out with their friends before and afterwards. And they're much less understanding of this if they have to do it online. Like it's just zero fun online. And in the classroom, okay, 10 more minutes and then finally we can get out of here. Um, so I am worried that um, we're at this moment that's in some ways this huge opportunity. Um, I think to Allison's point, it's like it's bringing inequities into such stark contrast. But in some ways for 20 years, we've been promising that digital technology can help solve the equity problem or at least alleviate it, right? So, and what we're realizing is it's making it worse because the people who have other res responsibilities or who don't have the same le level of access are hugely falling behind. They're completely falling out of the picture actually. We don't even see them on the Zoom room. Like they're not even, no one even knows that they've fallen behind. And then secondly, with pedagogy, I feel like, you know, we've been, we've been, I mean, this is me, I shouldn't say we, I, I think we, but I, I'll take full responsibility. I've been trying to tell people, like, this could be great, we could be learning in these new environments online. And now that it's like, we, we are all learning online. And what's happened is, is really not that it's, it's lectures, and it's 
pretty demotivating. And so I'm actually worried that there's going to be this backlash where people say it's actually not working at all, this online stuff. Like we've tried it now and um, we need to go back to face to face. And that's the only thing that that works and that the pioneers right now are are not able to get their message across or not able to get enough pilots going at scale so that uh, it counters kind of the other narrative. Um, so, so sorry, that's a little bit, but to your point, I think the most interesting things are where people use tools that were not designed for learning or for running or for actually not maybe for learning, but not for education, for like um, teaching people, but more for collaboration. So um, things like Notion, for example, it's like a wiki, basically. It's a fancy new wiki that's unfortunately not open source or things like Miro, which is a, again, not open source, but it's a, like a fancy whiteboarding application where you can move post-it notes around um, or Slack or, you know, things like Slack, Mattermost, like there's lots of open, open source. So it's like the tools that people use to communicate, to collaborate, to hang out with each other, to talk to each other. I feel like the best examples, they're starting with those tools rather than with learning management systems. I, we, we've almost kind of, we're, we're already going in the wrong direction if we think of this as a management uh, problem. Um, so, I'm uh, I'm still hopeful. I'm an optimist. I, I know all of you are. Um, so I, I'm hoping that we can kind of start shifting the this a little bit, the narrative, but also the actual practice. Because at MIT, we've done like Alison. I've spent the last three months talking to people, interviewing people, and MIT actually has done a huge amount of surveys, and the results are not encouraging. A lot of students are considering to take a gap year if there's any um, sense of this continuing. Uh, motivation has been reported as a huge issue. It's just students aren't motivated to participate. They came to MIT because they wanted to be part of this community. They wanted to be feel connected to the institution and they don't right now. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I'm trying to as fast as possible kind of get some, get some alternatives launched and, and so that people see, no, there's actually some real benefits to this and we can, it can improve equity it can improve pedagogy and so, but we've got our work cut out for, for ourselves, I think. Um, to, if I get to ask a question, it's to anyone who wants to answer, but it's about how will this affect institutions going forward and how does this um, highlight certain strengths in different models? So for example, public versus private or small versus large or open universities or online universities versus more campus-based universities. Like what are we, what do we think is going to be the effect on the institution of the university from all of this. If, if I can respond to that, Philip, um, I think it's a fantastic question because I think some of the ways that um, education is going to be disrupted are not in the ways that, that, that we tend to talk about upfront. I think finance is going to be one of the major disruptors and that some of the public institutions have already been struggling with, um, it, at least in some of the Western countries, with, with a reduction in, in government funding. So they're still public institutions, but they're having to operate in an almost private way. And I think that gives them a disadvantage over some of the private institutions. And so obviously um, a difficulty, particularly universities who rely on international students there's a worry that the there'll be a big reduction in the number of students seen at UCL. We have done scenario planning and we're planning for a reduction of up to 50% of our students who possibly can't come to campus. But we don't know what's going to happen. We just, it's, it's a huge uncertainty and universities have never um, had such a high degree of uncertainty as we have now. So we just have to adapt and learn how to deal with these types of uncertainty. Um, the online universities right now seem to be benefiting because they are having a higher number of applications from students who are thinking, well, if I can't go onto campus and I'm not sure whether I can or not, um, then I might as well do a year online or study online somehow. So I think in, in the short term, they're benefiting. But then again, longer term, we don't really know what the impact is going to be. Yeah, and looking at this from the, from the US perspective, in terms of 
just watching that. I'm actually in Italy, but my career and my work mainly happens in the United States. And one of the things raging, if you watch Twitter or you look at the, the higher ed sector, just discussion wise is should people even go back at this point, given the fact that the numbers are still so high and that are we putting profit and finance before the safety of our communities? And that's like Allison said, gonna hit some universities much harder than others. Some can sit it back, but it almost feels looking out um, like an existential crisis very different from here in Italy, where the expectation is there's no money always, and the EU may or may not bail us out. But like, there's also not the same cost involved in higher ed. And to Philip's point, like, I understand people want to go to class so that they can meet after class. But when your parents paying 50, 60, $70,000 a year to do that in a virtual um, reality where everyone has the same environment, Everyone has the same LMS. Everyone has the same technology tools. Like, what are we talking about there? Like, there's no differentiation outside the professor and outside that relationship, which opens up a whole nother question about the MOOC rock star professors who create their own. So like, in some ways, there is some deep existential questions, at least from the United States, as I look at it, given the relationship to financing of higher ed, how much a big how big a part of that is for the everyday person's debt load and what that would look like um, if this started to collapse for that economy. So it's, you know, we're still in it enough. Italy, now we're going into like, hey, we're outside. Hey, I cannot wear my mask in certain contexts, right? In the US, it's still people battling over, can I wear a mask in the store? I mean, it seems ludicrous from the outside looking in but if you take that and you map that on top of the higher ed world, especially with everything at stake financially, I don't know how the fall semester can go well. And the other thing is the risk involved. The University of Mary Washington, small public, public liberal arts college in Virginia, no one's heard of, right? They're taking a risk. They don't have a huge endowment to open up again and bring students back because if they don't, they're at a survival crisis. But think about the question as a president or the, the moral conundrum you find yourself in, where you're doing that for the existential, for, to lit, survive as an institution, but then what if the crisis comes back and the virus explodes? What's on your hands? So I don't know. I, there's no easy question, but I, from that context, it's crazy. Can I just say, I absolutely disagree that online is a leveler. Uh, I think what online does is it, it hides some of the disadvantages that students are experiencing um, because in in the background, I mean, even staff, um, there's a behind the background, behind the, behind the screens that we see behind us, there could be chaos going on. So we, we have colleagues living in central London in very small apartments that are very expensive, where they maybe have um, a partner or even a housemate. They're having to negotiate who's going to do the teaching from the pantry, who's going to do the teaching from the, the kitchen. Um, and so th this is the point that some of these disadvantages that people experience are actually being um, highlighted and um, they're, they're actually greater than they were before. And I think that's also true for our students. So what you're saying basically is we're back to Maslow, right? I mean, you know, before we can talk about pedagogy, you know, people have to have their basic needs. And, and, and one of the things the pandemic has done is really kind of brought us down to that level of, you know, some people are now struggling with their basic needs. And, you know, um, and so they're not really, they don't have the space to think about education at all, let alone online education. Um, that that said, I, I do think that, you know, it's it's a really it's a matter of of the values that we project into our teaching. So if uh, you know, if we use technology that you can access through a mobile phone, then you know, then we're accessible to more students. And if we use some virtual world that requires a high processor or something like that, right? So it's, it's you know, it comes down to the decisions that we make as educators. 
It's funny it's, though. I'm sorry, go ahead, Alison. Uh, so I was just going to say, but it's beyond the technologies. The technologies are, you know, in some, some people are advantaged by using technologies because um, there are people with disabilities who can't go on a campus. For example, that's why open universities tend to have a very high proportion of um, very talented students who just happen to have a disability. However, um, the point is that even if we use the most mobile technologies, there are people who, whose living circumstances makes it more or less impossible for them to learn or to teach because they simply don't have the thinking space. I'm see, I see there's an interesting comment here from... Rick. I think there are several questions, actually, and we said we would open up for, for yeah. people, so... Maybe this is the right time to do that. Yeah. So, so we yeah, Rosa? first uh, it was it was a nut asking whether what we were saying was referring to it, it was a global phenomena or or more local. A nut, do you want to elaborate on that or yeah. because I don't know exactly what at that point where you were yeah. referring to. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, it became a bit depressing hearing that institution will be closed down in the U.S. etc. So I was wondering whether. It's only in the U.S. or is it like a worldwide phenomena uh, that institutions like the enrollment will be lower and, and institutions will close? Or whether maybe it's contrary, like people will have more time. So maybe they wouldn't want to pay necessarily, but uh, they'll have time to, to study or they will want to switch occupations. So let's take, uh, let's say they, they decide they want to study programming for now because it opens more opportunity rather than history, etc. So I'm wondering about like uh, what will be in a global sense and also in a local sense in, in Israel uh, about the higher education. Well, Yish, I'll jump in here. Yishe did know that, you know, Israel didn't get hit as hard and good for you all. Like you were able to manage some of that. It, Italy got hit really hard. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But it, Italy got really hit really hard in late February, early March, locked down severely. And now we're coming out pretty cleanly. The US didn't. And so it's uneven depending on the country and the context. So to your point, though, that I think is interesting is while I agree with Allison that there are real particular like disadvantages for folks given the context of, I can't do this in my apartment or I don't have the technology. At the point being together is not a possibility as we've all dealt with to some degree over the last three or four months, the internet has proved a boom. Like no matter what we say about online learning, no matter what we say, whether you do it well or bad, like it's allowed a lot of us to do things we couldn't have done without it. And also, we have communities and places where we go to think, to learn, to share, to commune online. There's no reason why we can't figure that out for higher ed well. And I think that is just bottom line, like what technologies do that, how we do that for a community is gonna vary depending upon your community, depending where you're coming from, depending your background, but I think it can happen. And how we do that, um, doesn't have to be a one size fits all like Zoom or like the learning management system or the virtual learning environment. Um, but I think Philip mentioned it. There are technologies people are using online that aren't necessarily educational tools that take us pretty far towards learning something, towards communing, towards doing some of those things that we feel like we need an institution to do in between the interests. So I think in interest for all of us in the field, we should be thinking about that not about getting back to a normal we don't know if it's sustainable three or four months in so i'd like i'd like to add something if possible sure. uh, i think there is a like studying things that are maybe more theoretical uh, but there is also the practice like students learning to be a uh, whether it's hairdresser or whether it's uh, engineers, uh, like the, the practicum, or teachers, or uh, and this um, practicum in the field, when the field is in a uh, chaos, this is uh, another uh, really challenge. So 
it's one thing to, to, to move to Zoom, to, to Moodle, whatever, and to do synchronous or asynchronous uh, classes, but it's uh, another challenge how to make sure that the student uh, really um, have the practicum to, to become nurses, doctors, engineers, whatever. Yeah, so it's another thing to, to think about. So it's, it's true that obviously um, if you want to study philosophy or you want to study programming, it's easier to do that online rather than if you want to start to study architecture or nursing or hairdressing. Now, architecture, you know, we have a session later today from Bezer College of Arts where they talk about how they teach design online. So, you know, I think people are finding solutions. Um, medical professions, you know, it's a challenge, but I think people are finding solutions. Hairdressing, well, the problem is that, you know, if all the hairdressers are, are closed, that you don't have anywhere to practice, right? I mean, I guess you can practice on your flatmates. But, you know, I, I think that definitely different disciplines uh, require different solutions. And, but most of the solutions exist. And again, you know, online teaching or learning is never the same as as face to face but but then yeah you get other other advantages so i think um the the really the differentiator is not so much the discipline but but more of the kind of the background factors that <clears throat> you know Alison was talking about in german and i think there's you see in the, in the chat in countries which have a, a kind of um a, a more sort of a social approach where they see education as a national investment and they have uh, the the capacity to say, okay, this is a period of, of instability. We can invest in education so that this will pay off in a few years. Then education might flourish. Countries which are, you know, based on the cruel capitalistic model and everything is pretty much determined by the the market, you know, then universities will collapse. I think now Lisa wanted to answer a question. Yeah, there was a question, there was a question about how to move people um, from, you know, from being in that category of, well, I just want to go back to the way things are, to moving them into being, um, to being more accepting of online. And how, how can we realize that? Um, what I've been telling people is, you know, I've, I've studied this and the people on this panel have been doing this and, and studying it for, for over 20 years. So, and, and some of us for longer, but we won't point those people out, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and we have a lot of experience and I don't know if, if you've been noticing it, but there's been a lot of free webinars being offered through different organizations. Like I've been involved in some through Eden, uh, where we've been offering education during time of a pandemic series, where we've been giving guidance on how to do authentic assessments online, how to move online. Tony Bates gave a presentation on that. And it, and it wasn't just presentations. It, we, we want to give practical advice. What do you need to do? How can you do it? I did a webinar for ASCII Light last, uh, last week or the week before talking about what are the opportunities and where can you go from remote teaching, um, emergency re remote teaching to move into a more pedagogic, uh, pedagogic approach to your, to your teaching and learning. Um, so I think that there are opportunities and I think we need to show each other what those opportunities are. There needs to be communities of practice where we show examples of how best to do it. When I sit down with some of our, of our uh, program directors and our, and our instructors and they say, well, we're just gonna do it this way with the lecture, I give them the different possibilities that are out there. And by doing that, they, it's, it's like the whole spectrum gets opened up to them and they see all the, all the opportunities and possibilities that they didn't see before. So people don't like change and, and, and that's really going to be um, a critical factor is, is helping them to realize that this is not going to be a detrimental change for them, but it could actually be, be beneficial for them in the long run. And it's so really working to transition them to a place of, 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 of discomfort where they are now to maybe a place more comfort where they can see the benefits um, and get training. I mean, there are programs out there. Um, you know, we offer a program through our university uh, to, you know, to teach people how to do online teaching and learning. I know they do it in the States. I mean, there's lots of opportunities. There's MOOCs that are being offered. So if you don't want to spend the money for a course or certificate, 
you know, there's lots of opportunities and talk to your instructional designers. They have ideas and they know what, what can be done um, to, to really make this a positive experience. And it, it's, it's interesting. One of the things to follow up on what you're saying, wherever you are, Lisa, in relationship to me is like why I, I read an article today or yesterday that video conferencing, commercial video conferencing is 50 years old. The first one was done in Alcoa with the mayor from Pittsburgh in 1970, which is trippy to think about. And the first video call arguably was in 1920. And so some of what we're doing here is already trailing edge technology. But I also think one of the things, a class I was, had been a part of called Digital Storytelling 106 or DS106, spent a lot of times having students create actually not only video, images, gifts, et cetera, but creating radio shows. And I often thought this would be a really interesting time to think through with communities radio. Like how do you create, like the, the MOOCs and the video focus of the MOOCs for me is a little bit like that's YouTube. It never seemed that radical. But the idea of returning to something like radio, something that's low bandwidth, something that's experimental, something that you can play with, like the train outside of my window, like you can hear it. Like the idea is that you actually, you can create different learning spaces and scapes. And I think we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves as, an, as a discipline right away saying, why isn't everything great? It's been three months now. We've all been locked down globally. Why haven't we figured this out? And I, I think that's a little bit disingenuous. I think we have time and I think we have the technology, but I also think we have a lot of trained, smart, exciting people who can actually you know, help us think through this possibility without doing the either or. We're either back in classroom or education sucks. It's like, it doesn't have to be that, but it seems that's the questions being posed that seem almost, you know, to have their own agenda. And I've always been for experimenting with educational technology. It's been brought up the idea, Laya brought it up, like why does everything have to be synchronous? We've done a lot of great asynchronous stuff with blogs, syndication, the ability to create um, tools like Mattermost where you have chats and channels where you come in and it's more fluid and seamless. But the idea that everybody has to be somewhere at some time seems more about giving us structure and a sense of order as we're all dealing with the chaos of the world around us than good pedagogy per se. And I think that's something we can kind of think through as we say this might be a longer term thing. So I think that, that kind of connects to the question that you are is asking if, you know, um, if we should also move away from the sort of the familiar traditional structures of, you know, the 90 minute class and or the, the sort of fixed cohort or, you know, if we're taking things asynchronously, if we're using different media, if we're not actually in the same place in the same time, then what's the meaning of a 45 minute lecture or a 90 minute lecture or maybe, you know, and, and when you look at open universities, right, I mean, the online courses don't have that structure. But I know that in Israel, you have, maybe you want yeah, to ask. I'm no longer at the Open University for, I'm at the IDC Herzliya, which is Israel's private university. Uh, so I want to add two comments and two insights. One, that we are running a uh, parallel research to this semester. Uh, and what our um, experts are finding that Zoom-based teaching, which we are totally unused to, we are an online, we are a campus-based <laughs> university, uh, fits very nice with introvert students. They feel really good about online. They don't need to come to class, uh, be shy from their friends and colleagues, uh, raise their head in class. But the extroverts are really suffering because this is this used to be their playground, and now it's been taken away. So uh, I think uh, maybe Jim said that not one size would not fit all. So I don't want to reuse this token of you know blended, hybrid, whatever model. But and this is the reason why I put this comment that we need probably, and this is what I will recommend my president to break away from the 90-minute lecture time and we will need to fractionize uh, the way we teach because people cannot honestly it's very hard to maintain coherence and concentration 
for hours and hours and hours on Zoom. So what we did, that, well, regardless, we had the same schedule transferred from face-to-face -to, -face to Zoom, which necessitated eight hours continuously in front of a screen. Students just wanted to slit their wrists. They couldn't do it. So uh, looking at the fall semester, which we are now planning, I got today the schedule and it's basically the same. Same schedule as last year, 90 minute, 10 minute break, 90 minute. Now consider doing that with a hybrid Zoom based class. God, I, I don't think we can pull this through at least for most of the students and the teachers. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I'm going to, I'm going to put my, my talk signal up here. I think there's a, there's a great professor. His name is Antonio Vantaggiato. He teaches at University of Sagrado in uh, Puerto Rico. And he wrote a post and I can link to it in the, in the chat where he talks about how he syndicated out his classes. There was some zoom, but not full classes. There was some expected work, which happened with blogs and syndication. There was projects where students would work together remotely on Google Docs and other things to build out. Pro mm -hmm. So like he tried to distribute the load and also understand, like you're pointing out, the limits of time. And especially like the, life has changed for everybody in radical ways, some more than other, as Allison pointed out. And can your pedagogy also address that? yet try and do as much coverage as possible with being there or losing credit. You know, that's, it's kind of draconian, but everybody's up against the wall because we don't know what's expected. To Maya's point earlier, my prof the professors, the teachers teaching my kids here in Italy for like a month, no one did anything because no one knew what to do. And when they came back, they kept the students in classes on, you know, Google Meet, which is Zoom for Google for six or seven hours a day. And it was just, you know, overcompensation. Oh, they were just figuring out what they were doing. So it, I agree. I think it's a bad model. And I think there's other ways to say video and so. Uh, I would we like could, to. We could, we could uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to break you guys off because we've um, run over time, unfortunately. Yeah. And we need to move on. You, every, you need the, to move on to your next, next session. Right. The next session starts in six minutes, but. Uh, we were talking about asynchronous, so I guess we can continue this conversation on the session page asynchronously. And if there is enough uh, enough interest, then actually Rike from uh, Denmark uh, offered to host a follow-up meeting when she's back from summer holiday. So we can try to uh, we'll advertise it somehow to the people who will figure out a way to advertise it. Yeah, well, um, Twitter. I would like, can I have one minute just to say, okay, Who, whoever has to go, go, but give me a minute to say what I, I how I see it. Uh, I believe that all the knowledge transfer should be asynchronous, okay? So you can make in advance videos, podcasts, um, even TED Talks, written materials. The students should read this before class. Then they come to class, either Zoom or on campus, okay, depending on COVID situation. And in class, what they do is a group um, discussion and uh, exercises and PBL and all the things you can do asynchronous. That's the best way to do this, to use the time and um, resources wisely. Because to do a lecture on Zoom is a waste of time. It's very difficult for a lot of students to sit, and all people, to sit a whole day and listen to lectures on Zoom. And there's no reason they do that, to do that. When they listen to lectures offline, they can do it double the time or half the time. And, you know, it's cheesy for them. So that's my schnickel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we'll move on and continue the discussion on the website and on Twitter and hopefully in, in the next time we can meet all together. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Zohar, before you take it.